All right, everybody, welcome. Um, my name is Barbie Winterbottom, and we are kicking off our first kind of roundtable conversation with some of the folks from the Business of HR community. I'm excited to see all of you here, and other folks may join as we go. We had quite a few folks RSVP that they would be here, but we all understand things happen, and if you're on East Coast time, it's 5.30, and you never know. And I know um, one of our folks does have to jump off a little bit early, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we are recording this session so that we can share it with folks on LinkedIn, and they can learn a little bit about the Business of HR community and some of our members. So we're going to just do a round robin introduction, and uh, we will start with Orlando. Thank you so much, Barbie, uh, for inviting me to the the group. Uh, I love that this is forming, uh, and, and I already see it's going to make an impact. So, Orlando Hangs, Talent Acquisition Manager. I've been in that space for about 16 years. Uh, I've also been blessed to publish three books. So my nine to five is talent acquisition manager for Sykes, which is a global BPO company headquartered here in Tampa. <laughs> then my five to nine, sorry about that folks. Uh, five to nine is where I do uh, corporate train, not tr corporate training, but individual training um, as well as coaching uh, and speaking. So uh, as I mentioned, I'll be sharing a platform shortly in about 48 hours with these two dynamic ladies, uh, Barbie Woodabonham and Liz M. Lopez. So I look forward to that. Uh, so yeah, I'm just excited. What I what I hope to learn is a deeper understanding of the the HR. Um, you know, just get a little more in depth about what that is. I already have a good understanding, but I want to go deeper in that. Uh, what I can add value to. One of my major topics uh, is now pushing branding, how to brand yourself. If there are some folks who want to go outside just the nine to five and become speakers or authors um, and kind of spread their knowledge. So I'll sum it up before I take up too much time and that'll be it. Awesome. Thank you. And you are, you are very humble, Orlando. You're doing a whole lot more than that. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, Liz, would you go next for us? Sure. So uh, Barbie, thank you so much for the invitation to be a part of this community. I love what you're, you're creating and, and so excited to support you in the growth of it. So I am Liz M. Lopez. I am a career and business coach. And uh, in May, I celebrated 13 years of doing this work. And, uh, and I love it. I love working with my corporate professionals. Uh, Orlando said something really critical, which is branding. And while we tend to think of branding in terms of companies, branding is critically important for corporate professionals and leaders as they're either looking to rise in within their companies or making career transitions. And I love helping them shape their stories so they can land the lucrative jobs that they absolutely love. Yeah. And I love working with my business owners, my entrepreneurs who are getting really clear on what their value proposition is really being able to connect that to their audiences and streamlining their system so they can enter into what I like to call um, joyful profitability. <laughs> I like that phrase. That's awesome. So, you know, I, I, my angle, so to speak, in, in my, con my always looking to contribute in any way that I can, whether that's as a coach, a speaker, or, or just kind of a, a person to brainstorm with in this organization that you've created but on the learning side is looking on when, when you know, I'm, I'm on the side of kind of coaching these individuals looking to join organizations. So what are the HR professionals, especially on the talent acquisition side, what are they looking for? What are they hoping to see? What makes it easy for them to choose person A over person B? So any insights I gain on that side so I can better support my clients is phenomenal. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great insight. And it's funny because I, somebody had introduced me recently to LinkedIn Pro, which I don't know if you guys know anything about it. I was naive to this. I don't know. I've been living under a rock apparently. But um, so I signed up for LinkedIn Pro and my inbox is flooded with people. Um, if you haven't done that and you're a coach, I encourage you to do so. Um, I spoke with a gentleman today about helping him in his career with interview training and helping him develop his career and we're going to start working together. Um, but it's a great resource out there. Um, and if you are into resume writing, 
you could work 24 hours a day on resume writing with as many you know requests and, and and hits that i've been getting and i'm not even doing resume writing but holy cow that is a huge huge area of linkedin that i didn't even know existed so so Barbie, I've been training LinkedIn for over 10 years and I've been a member of ProFinder now for a, a little over two years. And I, and I can tell you one of the this most interesting and also kind of saddest thing is, you know, you get the notifications when you're one of the providers and Sunday nights, the request for resumes is huge. Wow. Unbelievable. See? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that tells you something, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yeah. Sean, you want to go? Next. Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Barbie. Thanks for hosting this. It's a great group. Um, I've been, uh, I would say, private practicing now since October. I have a 25-year executive, uh, formerly with Mosaic. I've done private equity plays in Align and Blue Grace. And I actually stumbled into um, just helping others. I mean, it's been kind of nice not doing anything for a couple of months, and then COVID kicked in. And a lot of my uh, HR colleagues out there, unfortunately, were furloughed or laid off. And I hate writing resumes. And I think HR people are the worst at writing resumes. Um, and uh, unfortunately, most of my colleagues out there don't have the resources to pay for a professional resume writer. So I've done some resume writing. Uh, but more than that, I've actually helped place um, some of my colleagues because I've got a, a vast network. I've been around for ever and a day. So it's been nice to help transition. And I think what I want to offer to the group is obviously learn. There's so much I need to learn, even though I've been doing this forever. But the others just offer up my services and, and help. I've got union experience, traditional HR, tactical, as well as some strategic. And my joy has been international HR, but I don't plan on doing that anytime in the near future. So I can help wherever I can. Well, thank you for that, Sean. You've got a wealth of experience I know we'll all be able to benefit from. I've not worked in a union environment. You know, I know enough to be dangerous, um, and I don't particularly want to work in a union environment, but it's good to know somebody who has, should that ever come up as, as a challenge for me. So, um, Anthony, how about you go next for us? Sure thing. Um, Anthony Kidd here. Um, uh, most people here call me AJ. Um, I'm currently an HR business partner with a startup company here in Orlando, Florida called uh, Luminar Technologies. Um, and we create uh, the software and the hardware for a system that will hopefully empower autonomous driving. Um, we just landed a major deal. I'll share the link to that um, public announcement in the chat here shortly. Um, with Volvo. So we're really excited about that. Um, and we have offices um, in Palo Alto, California, as well as uh, Colorado Springs. Um, I've been doing this now for a little about six and a half years as far as HR is concerned. Um, just moved into the HRBP space as of March. So I'm really excited. Um, I was particularly attracted to this community. Um, by following you, uh, specifically Barbie, on LinkedIn as it relates to the importance of um, HR and business, that partnership. And as I move from that transactional space to that um, strategic space, you know, I was uh, really uh, um, interested in what, what you were sharing and had to say. So I'm very appreciative of this opportunity and um, what I'm looking to gain, honestly, is just industry experience or experience across the different industries, um, especially as it relates to our day-to-day -day, uh, processes in the human resources field. Um, and I can just contribute my experience from, from those industries as well. And, and Anthony, what did you do before you were in HR? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> were you trying to avoid that one? Because I zoned yeah. right in on that. <laughs> um, I'm prior military, so um, I kind of came out uh, with an electrical background and did um, work for, you know, as a service and um, service technician for a few different companies. And um, it was just a job, you know. Um, I went back to school later and kind of found my niche in HR, and it's been very rewarding. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your service. Appreciate that Thank you. very much. Thank you. Very, very much. All right. Cindy, I know you jumped in a little bit um, after we started, but we're just kind of introducing ourselves. Um, we are recording this so that we can share it on LinkedIn later, just as an FYI for you. Um, mm -hmm. But just sharing a little bit about where we are, who, you know, what we do, um, our career, and why we're here in the community, and what we're looking to get out of it, and maybe something we can contribute to the rest of the group. 
Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Cindy Guerrero. I work as an HR specialist for Blooming Brands. Blooming Brands is the home office for Outback, Carabas, Bonefish Grill, and Fleming's. Um, I stumbled upon the group of following Barbie as well. And what drove my attention to the group was that business of HR. Uh, there is a bad reputation for HR. Well, here comes HR. And we all, I always hear how we need to be more strategic and be part of the business so that we can have a place in the table, in the business table. And I am, out of everyone here, the most transactional one because I do very admin work. So I was interested in getting more experience and more exposure to more strategic and just advice and also work with other HR colleagues uh, outside of my uh, current field or current industry. So I've been in, with Blooming Brands for about a year, almost two years, but I'm originally from Dominican Republic. So this is my first US corporate experience in human resources. So I was, I'm looking into hearing other professionals. I am part of HR Tampa, uh, but also just wanted to get more connected with other professionals. And what I can bring to the table is my experience on day-to-day -day things that are technical and admin and some ideas and feedback on what works and what doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. I do work supporting the corporate office. I don't support the restaurant itself, but I am exposed to that. And there is a little difference when you support a corporate office that is hospitality based than the actual field of hospitality and your people in the restaurant. So yeah. Um, that and my Spanish is what it can uh, add to the group. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah, I've, um, I've worked in home offices and field offices. And no matter what anybody tells you, they are different animals. They absolutely are. <laughs> uh, well, welcome, everyone. Um, so I, I have worked in HR for a little over 20 ish years, <laughs> somewhere between 20 and 25. Um, and I have, I have deep roots in talent acquisition, in high volume talent acquisition. Um, I've worked for global organizations like Capital One, Amazon, Sykes, um, Orlando, and I have that in common. Um, and I've worked in multiple different roles and capacities all the way up to my most recent role, which was Chief HR Officer for uh, BitGraphic. And as a result of COVID, my position was eliminated as the CHRO. And um, so it fast forwarded some plans I already had in the works of launching my own um, firm. And I, I really want to go about this a bit differently than the traditional um, HR consultant. Uh, as you know, Sean, I'm sure from sitting in your seats um, as the head of HR in the past, you are inundated inundated with constant sales pitches from consultants who say, I can come in and turn around your culture. I can come in and train your people. I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. But there really isn't anyone out there going directly to the individual practitioners to help them understand how to grow their career and to your point, to understand the business side of being a professional HR person. And I see that as, as a huge gap. Um, and it's what I love doing best. I love growing HR talent. Um, I've, I have some great success stories of folks who have worked for me over time and have grown their HR careers. Um, and so I wanted to launch something where I could use you know, the web and, and all these digital mediums and digital platforms to go directly to individuals who want to connect and grow their careers. So hence, the business of HR has been born and here we are on our first call. So I'm very excited. Um, I do have some some pretty big plans. So yes, thank you for the, the, for the applause. Um, and I have launched a YouTube channel. I will have a podcast. Um, I have different networking um, 
areas and, and kind of created this, this virtuous cycle of each one of these different entities feeds the other one to help grow our community, but also grow the business that I am building. Um, and, and really the cornerstone of the business is all of you, the community, but also I'm anchoring it to those five essential um, areas that I believe HR professionals need to have. And I think, you know, Anthony and, and Cindy, you referenced those, right? So how do you as an HR person learn to be a business leader first and an HR or functional leader second? And that's so incredibly critical. And if we took that 30,000 feet up and said, anyone, not just HR, but if you're in finance or sales or marketing or customer service, anyone can apply this same methodology if you think about it right you should be a business leader first and a functional leader second whatever that function happens to be and what happens is we get caught in the bubble of whatever function we perform and everything we do is then often clouded by that lens and we forget that the work we do is for a greater cause which is to support the overall business. And that's, that's kind of um, the genesis of all of this for me. And it really came to light at, as, at my last role as CHRO, I had inherited a team. And you know, when that happens, oftentimes you, you, there's turnover and, and then you're, you're coaching people who have worked for the company longer than you. And I was meeting with some business partners and talking to them about how my vision for them is to move away from this transactional tactical work. Uh, your purpose in life is not to submit insurance claims on behalf of an employee. Your purpose in life is not to show someone what their paycheck stub looks like. Your purpose in life is not to fight a claim for a pharmacy, whatever, right? That is not the role of a business partner. And there was, there was a lot of push and pull with this. And I found it quite interesting um, because I would hear them say, we, we want to be, we, we don't want to be so tactical and, and we don't want all this administrative work. And yet when I would offer them strategic opportunities, they were not jumping on it. So I was very confused. Finally, one of them had the courage to say to me, if you keep taking away all this administrative work, I don't know what my job is. They did not, right? The light bulb went off. Because we use this word strategy, we use this phrase strategic HR. But if you've never done it, you don't know what that means. So you revert back to doing what you know and what you know is processing those transactional aspects of your role, right? So it, it was the light bulb for me that was like, oh my goodness, there's, a, there's, there's some learning here. And, and then when I took it another step and started looking at what was available for HR folks in, in a learning and development space, yes, you can get your, your certifications out there from some of the big HR certification groups, but they're all compliance-based. They are making sure you understand FLSA and EEOC and DOL and Civil Rights Act and all of that, which is incredibly important. I'm not minimizing or diminishing the value of knowing those compliance pieces, but that is, a, that is one aspect, right? That is but one fraction of the work we do in HR. And I believe that because so much of the education and learning and certification is based on that, it has also in many ways created a fear culture within the HR space because we're so afraid of litigation. We are, we are trained and it is ingrained in our brains to be avoiders, right? We are avoiding litigation at all costs. So everything we do, we look at through the lens of litigation avoidance which is not necessarily bad, but our work and our value is so much greater. And that's what I'm hoping to help all of you and everyone else in our community understand, that we don't have to be fear-based. 
We don't have to be the HR policy police. We don't have to be those transactional people. We can be strategic HR business leaders and add value in so many different ways if we just take those handcuffs off a little bit and start looking at the work we do a bit differently. So that's my, that's how all this came to be. Um, so yes, Liz, there's safety in making widgets, right? It's, it's, it's easy when you, when you have transactional work, you then very quickly have metrics and everybody likes metrics, right? Everybody can say, oh, well, we, we have, you know, here's our hiring numbers, here's our attrition numbers, here's our head count, boom, we're done. But how deep are you going with those attrition numbers? I just had this conversation with someone the other day around attrition because um, I was actually, I was being interviewed for a radio, a business radio show, and she asked me for an example of what traditional HR looks at versus perhaps what we could be looking at. And I said, well, okay, attrition. Right, so for those of you who are newer to the HR space, that's a standard metric that every company typically looks at. And if they're looking at it, what I have found is organizations like to share what? They like to share their monthly attrition number. Now, that is very different than an annualized attrition number. And so you ask your, how many times have you had this happen? What's your, what's your attrition? It's 4%. Hmm, that's incredibly low. Is that monthly or is that annualized? It's monthly or weekly, depending on the company, right? And if that's a weekly or a monthly number and you annualize that out, that is a significantly greater attrition number, right? And then if you take it deeper, and this is where we start to, to look at it and, and gain some insights, when is that attrition happening? In, in the life cycle of the employee, is it happening at 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? When in their life cycle do we see that attrition spiking? Because what you'll often find, right, is that 60% of that attrition is happening at day 91, as an example. Well, a strategic HR person is gonna laser focus in on that and say, okay, Let's peel this back. What's happening at day 91? What's causing those people? Because that 4%, which you trended out and it becomes what, 48% annualized? If, so if 60% if of your 48% is happening at day 91, you, you're, you have a constant churn in that early employment, right? So no wonder you're not gaining any traction because half or more of those people are leaving and you're not getting any tenure out of them. And what, what's happening? So then you start to look at your nesting program if you have that or whatever the circumstances are. And you just keep going deeper and deeper into the scenario to find out the root cause. But to just simply sit back and report 4% a month without telling the story is doing a disservice to the organization. And I know a lot of folks don't spend the time to go deeper into those types of metrics. So that's what I mean when I say be a business leader first is use your analytical skills, um, look at numbers and data differently, but also understand what's happening in the landscape of business itself. What metrics does your company use to measure success or failure? Do you have EBITDA goals? Do you have shareholder um, earnings that you're looking at? Do you have, who are your competitors out there? Who are, um, you know, where do you rank among your competitors? Who are your top five customers? And what are their numbers? What does that look like? What makes them one of your top five customers? And what percentage of your business do those top five customers make? Right, because we all, I think, initially think, oh, well, X company is 40% of our business. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. Is it? Is that really great? Because that's also a huge risk if something happens to that company and that's 40% of your business, right? So start looking at all of these different elements that impact your business that 
may or may not have anything to do with HR, but they have to do with your business. So that's just the first of the five elements. I'd love to hear what you guys think about some of that. And welcome, Kay, you joined a little bit late. Um, we'd love to hear from you as well and kind of your background. Um, so maybe we can do that at the end. Yeah, yeah Barbie, I can't, I can't agree more with you on your, on your statements. Um, and I've got to unfortunately drop off folks. Um, I'm attending the um, post COVID workshop or certificate with USF that was offered up in uh, Career Source Tampa Bay is uh, sponsoring that. And uh, as the chair, I need to participate. Um, the, the interesting thing for me is when I talk to HR practitioners and, and you hit it on the head, you know, it's not the come fetch go anymore. It's the strategic business partner. I also talk about the fact that we now have ISO standards around HR, which never existed before. And there's, I think, seven categories on that. And Barbara, you hit a, a touch point with attrition, turnover, churn, you know, what number? And do you, do you look at it from a annual annualized or rolling calendar or, or what? And those numbers can be manipulated. And that standardization is so important for HR, for benchmarks at the board level, uh, for profits, nonprofits, or even private equity firms. People want to know what you're going to do as an HR partner to uh, to improve the processes, and you've got to have those benchmarks, and you got to standardize them against the uh, the norm. So, Absolutely. with that, I'll, I'll sign off. But I really appreciate this, Barbie, and the team. And uh, uh, feel free to reach out to me, and I'd be happy to help out. And I want to continue to participate. Well, enjoy the rest of your evening. Sounds like you've got some work ahead of you. <laughs> Thanks, right. John. See you guys. Bye bye. Anybody else want to weigh so, in? I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah. Yeah, I'll jump in on that because I think part of the the dynamics in, in any organization and really in any department is that they are going to uh, a lot of times perform to their metrics, right? So if the metrics by which you are evaluating and even uh, rewarding and bonusing your your associate and your leaders is disconnected from the real actions that benefit the organization then you are by default even with the best intentioned groups going to have a dis a disconnect in that kind of behavior you're, you're driving behaviors where if you need us to have a four percent or lower attrition rate then we're going to give you a four percent or lower lower monthly attrition rate because nothing rewards us to look deeper and to rock the boat and to go into having greater conversations that, you know, hey, maybe would be healthier at a 5% uh, until we can figure out how we revamp our talent acquisition so that we're not dropping people off at, at day 91, right? right. So um, I find that so often it is legacy performance evaluations and measures that are just no longer aligned to what is actually good for the company. I couldn't agree more and I would take that a step further when you look at what are you measuring internally and how does that align to your customer experience? Right. We, we say one thing, we want an amazing customer experience. We want our customers to feel cared for. When we answer those calls, we want to make sure they get all the information they need and they have this well-rounded, holistic, amazing experience. But your average handle time needs to be less than 43 seconds a call. Right. Yep. And, and your conversion rate better be 33% or higher. There you go. Right. So you've got these almost like diametrically opposed messages that you are sending to your employees. So it's meet these metrics, but deliver this amazing service. And at what point is there, is it, is it a breaking point that it's absolutely not attainable? And, and when your folks realize that and it registers that one, I'm either never going to be successful in X, Y, and Z metric or I'm never going to be successful in this, right? Then, then they're either there and they're just punching a clock because they are apathetic and they don't care anymore because caring drives the metric the wrong way as far as linking to their bonus. 
right? I've lived this where we, we say this is what we want for our customers, but here's how we're paying your bonuses. So what do they do? They perform to the bonus and yet the customer experience is tanking, but we're not doing anything internally to drive that, right? So that's where the strategic HR person as a partner to the business should be bringing this forward and saying, okay, here's the five metrics we're measuring and we're bonusing our people on. And yet here's how we have defined who we are as a company and what we want our customer experience to look like. Where's the disconnect here, right? And, and are we really allowing our people to connect to our purpose or are we driving apathy and therefore the people we are retaining are those who have just given up and they're here because where else are they gonna go? And the really high performers who have passion about their work can go somewhere else. Or they learned how to work the system. Right, and they go outside. I think you and system. I both have a, a background in call centers in Orlando, you probably can speak to this too. Yeah. But uh, you know, background in, in call centers, you learn. You learn which where you can sacrifice and where you need to push so that you can make the right amount of numbers and the right metrics to get the biggest bonus that month. Yep. Exactly. Yep. I think you hit it on the head, Barbie. When, when we're so focused on customer, it's external versus external training, going through change management. Uh, and what's, what I focus on a lot on is partnering with my HR team to now we're, we're the drivers of culture and how do we appreciate the employees uh, affirm them for what they do because truth be told right especially in the call center environment the lights will not be on without them it's we're not taking calls we're, we're not taking 300 calls 200 calls or whatever it is per per day so if we're not uh appreciating them with, with with just the minor small things a gift card um little things like that and really start to focus our attention on the people it, it'll drive the metrics because as you know i'm preaching to the choir here but they will enjoy coming to work. The numbers will self-correct themselves, and and now those coaching conversations are are less, uh, uh, you know, a less think of. They're not coming off as a uh, as a, a directive or it's a, a corrective action. It's more of a hey, you had a bad few calls. I noticed some things, and let's correct. And they're like, yep, we got it because there's a there's a unified culture that's built around, you know, we appreciate you for even just showing up, which is sometimes we get away from that, even though you're paid to do it, but still you didn't have to. But so we appreciate you showing up and then effectively doing the job. So that's one of the things I, I, I like to see with, you know, a partnership between talent acquisition and HR, if there's a separation in an organization. Um, but I think that's also a, a missing key there that it's not just on HR to be the policy police and the cultural, you know, cheerleaders for the entire department. No, that is, that is a, a unified um, uh, push from every employee internally. Absolutely, absolutely. And one of the, I was facilitating a change leadership session, and and hopefully with one of our one of our monthly calls, we'll talk about change leadership versus change management because they are different. They are very different and they need to work synergistically. But part of the content that I built around that was metrics are important, right? I, I firmly believe that measuring is important because it gives you a baseline to know if you're on track or off track, right? So I'm not diminishing the importance of metrics, but what we have to understand is metrics measure activity and customers could not care less about your metrics. And I, w whenever I would talk about this, I would get, you know, our frontline supervisors, whether it was in manufacturing or in customer service or finance, and they would get this kind of deer in their headlights. Like, what do you mean our customers don't care about our metrics? If we're hitting our metrics, then the customers are happy. And I'm like, mm, but are they? And I would walk through this scenario, right? And so um, I'll try to make this quick, but imagine you've worked a 10 hour day and you're exhausted at the end of, you know, you've worked five, 10 hour days, so it's Friday night and you're tired and you wanna go home and you know you don't have anything in the refrigerator. So you're like, I'm gonna go to my favorite restaurant. This is 
outside of COVID when you could actually go to a restaurant. I'm gonna go to my favorite restaurant and order my favorite meal. Cindy, this should resonate with you at Bloomin' Brands, right? I'm gonna order my favorite meal, my favorite glass of wine, and I'm just gonna sit there and eat it and I'm gonna go home and go to bed and you know, whatever. So you call ahead. Yes, we have a table, perfect. You get there, ready to be seated, and they're like, I'm sorry, we just got busy. Can you wait 15 minutes? Okay, I'm hungry, I'm tired, but I'll wait. So 15 minutes goes by, you check in with the sir or the host, and uh, five more minutes. Okay. So finally you get seated, the server comes over, and you're like, I want my favorite glass of wine. They, are, they already know what it is. Um, and they go back and they come, they, they go to the bar, they come back, and they're like, I'm sorry, we're out of your favorite wine. Can I offer you the substitution? You're like, okay, fine. Five more minutes go past, they come back and they're like, well, we didn't have that, but here's this one, would you like it? Fine, I'll take it. So now you're 30 minutes into your adventure and you order your favorite meal. So you want uh, a rare filet and a baked potato and a Caesar salad. Pretty basic, but that's what you want. So they go off. 20 minutes later, they come back and you've got a well done filet, mashed potatoes, and your salad never came. So you bring it to the attention of your server who's apologetic and would you like us to remake your meal? Well, no, now I've been here for almost an hour. I'm hungry, I'll just deal with it. Okay, well, let me get the manager for you then. Because they can't uncook the filet, they can't unmash the potatoes, right? So you know if you're gonna get what you want, you have to start all over again and you're not interested in that. So the manager comes over and apologizes. I'm sorry that, um, you know, we didn't get everything right for you tonight. Um, but you know, I don't really understand why you're that upset because 98% of our meals came out on time tonight. Do you wanna hear that? No right they hit their metric their metric goal was getting 98 percent of all meals out of the kitchen on time and accurate well they met their metric goal but you're the customer who didn't get it so you couldn't care less about their metrics you just wanted the meal you wanted in the way you ordered it right so that's what we have to start thinking about our customers in the way that they receive what it is we do both internal customers and external customers. And as HR folks, we have both, right? Our external customers are our candidates, our people we interact with in our communities, our internal customers are all of our employees, our executive team, if we're owned by a PE firm, whatever. So we've got to understand what our metrics are and how we're measuring our success, but also how are they defining success? If you were to go out right now to your internal customers and ask them, it, would you, would you stay, say right now that your HR team is meeting your expectations, what would they say? Would they say yes? Would they say no? Would they say sometimes, right? So you've got to understand how is it that your customer defines success and make sure that aligns with the metrics you're measuring. And if it isn't, then how do you bring that together so that you're doing the things you need to do and measure to meet that customer need? And we often don't get that right, not just in HR, but companies in general. So thank you for indulging me in that example, but sometimes it helps to bring things to life like that. And you're like, oh yeah, now I get it. Um, no, I, I love that analogy because if you're thinking of the mind of the customer, you don't care how well you did for other customers you're paying for your service you want your service at a certain level of expectation so you're only focused on what you're receiving and it better be in the in the spirit of excellence so you care less like i don't care if you did 150 percent right? right you missed and your your <laughs> your quarter was 151 you missed the one you missed the one and that one was me yeah got it i love it I see you shaking your head, Anthony. You got something there? No, I just completely agree. And um, everything that you're touching on working for a startup, these are things that we're wrestling with, right? Identifying all of these parameters and things and how to um, identify people leaving and why they're leaving and, and um, really just understanding the business. So, you know, I definitely hear what you're saying and it's, it's just amazing in a sense where, you know, my day-to-day -day has really been tackling a lot of these issues that we're having.
yeah. it's good that you're doing that early on as a startup because i can tell you after facilitating these change leadership sessions i had supervisors frontline supervisors in manufacturing and in customer service and in other areas call me or email me or stop by my office and say you know for 20 years i've been a supervisor and i thought i was i was customer focused but what i realized is i was metric focused mm -hmm. and i never really thought about the customer yeah. and we've got to flip that we've got to help people understand that really that should be one in the same you should be measuring to your customer promise whatever that is and then if you're meeting that, then you know you're meeting your customer expectations. But we've, we've gone sideways, I think. We've gone to where we measure so much, right? You could have come up with a metric for just about anything. And then we get so bogged down with all of these metrics, but who's, who's happy? What are, for what purpose? So I, I think that's great. I, I love hearing that you guys are, are you know, kind of digging into this early on. And if you can set that expectation on the very front end, then you're gonna have a much easier time down the road because it's very difficult to change that, um, that whole deal of, of metrics once you're in it, yep. right? Setting it up right on the front end is much, much easier. Hey, <laughs> Anthony, Anthony, a great book, uh, and Barbie would know this as well, is The 12 Leadership Principles of Amazon. Because uh, they, I, I believe they follow the, well, Simon Sinek got it from Amazon, <clears throat> that they're, they're, they're so focused on customer, they're customer-centric focused. It's the why behind the why behind the why. So yeah. if, if we're not serving the customer, that's why their customer service is phenomenal, right? You can ship a product back, get your money back before they receive it. All they need to know is that it's been scanned and it's on the way. Right, they don't know what's in the box. You could have been right, but their their customer service is so so phenomenal and they're so dominant in that space. Uh, it's because they built one of your points, Barbie, is the, um, the sense of trust. They built such a customer trust that everyone's going to continue to to you know to to purchase from them. But they're so customer centric focused. It's it's insane how it is. And it's simple, right? And, and bye, Liz. Thank you. I know you, you messaged us. You've got to jump off. So thank you for that, for being with us. Um, you know, having worked for Amazon, I can tell you that they do live and breathe the customer. And, you know, Bezos is quoted, um, Jeff Bezos is the founder of Amazon, as we focus on our customers and we let the competition take care of themselves. And that, if, if you're able to do that, that is you know far and above the best message you can send to your employees because it takes it takes their focus to the people who are actually spending money with them not just everybody else now you should know who your competition is i you know it's not every business in the world is amazon where you've just you know got world domination at this point so most companies do need to have some level of radar right of of what's going on in the market because amazon could be your new competition as they're you know emer getting into so many different emerging markets um but if you if you take that philosophy and really focus on your customer again internal and external it will help drive and you that can help formulate what your metrics should be and and what metrics are the most meaningful and simon sinek yes talks about finding your why and most companies focus on the how or the what and not the why and i don't know if 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 cindy and anthony if you know what we're talking about but um highly recommend you can go on youtube and watch simon sinek videos and his book and and all of that but you know a lot of companies focus on what they do and not why they do it and when you look at how employees connect they want to connect to your purpose and your purpose means they understand your why and if they don't you're there you're not going to have that emotional connection and that's what's so critical right is is that emotional um, connection that builds loyalty it builds pride it builds trust it builds longevity there's so many things that that go along with that so I think it's a great point, Orlando. Very cool. 
Yeah. So we, we will have a lot of conversation about all of these different elements. I'm sorry, Cindy, go ahead. No, it, it's okay. I just wanted to add that it's not only the customers that are looking for your purpose, uh, employees and candidates, now the younger generation, millennials, they do look for companies that have a purpose, that are involved in their community, that they are um, giving back and not only trying to be profitable, yes, a business should be profitable, but also, as you said, not the how, but also the why behind it. So I think that message that catering to the customers and they want to know what why your company is doing it your employees will also want to know why you're doing what you're doing because that will make them more engaged and feel more part of the mission and with the purpose and more willing and into giving themselves to the company to fulfill the purpose of the why they're you're doing business absolutely and that's really um when you think about your employees, your candidates, your employees as your internal customers, it makes a lot of sense. And I shared a video a month or so ago where I was talking about the, um, the 2019 Edelman Trust Barometer Global Report. And you can Google that or I can send you guys a link to it. I'll put it on the community, the, the Business of HR community. But in the Trust Barometer Report, it talks about how employees care more about connecting to the purpose of their employer than, uh, than as much as they do their compensation and benefits and perks. That connection to purpose is incredibly important. And, and when we talk about the generations of the future, we need to understand that the millennial generation, guys, is 50% of the workforce right now. Right? It's not the future. It's happening right now. <laughs> They're here and we need to understand that. We, I think sometimes we get caught up in talking about, yes, the generations of the future. And I'm like, um, hello, they're here. <laughs> They've been here for a while. Um, and it's not just them. I care very deeply about being connected to purpose. And I find when I'm not, oh, I can do it for a minute. I can do it for a little bit thinking I can change this, right? I can influence this purpose and I can make it different. I can make it meaningful. But just like everything else, you can't change other people. You can't, you can't change those types of things. So it becomes a rub after a while. And, and then you find yourself out of your integrity and you find yourself not living and working in your values. And that's when you start to disconnect from your organization and realize that it's time to move on. And we've all been there, right? We've all gone into those jobs. Well, you guys are really young. Maybe you haven't, but I have. I've gone into a company thinking, oh, well, it'll get better. It'll, it'll change. And it doesn't, right? I mean, it can. I'm not saying that it can't, but rarely does it. Um, I think it's uh, when Maya Angelou says, when somebody tells you who they are, believe them. Same thing with a company, right? When they tell you who they are, they show you who they are, believe them because it likely will not change. And if it does, it's not gonna change quickly for the most part. So cool, we are at 625. We could probably talk for hours, but I respect everyone's time. Um, so what did you guys think? Is this good? This kind of, does this format work for you guys? Would you like it more structured? Um, I can bring topics in every month or we can go through the five elements and just open up dialogue like this. I'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback. Um, I think this is great. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like in the middle of the road as it relates to, or easy going as it relates to uh, expectations. As long as we're having meaningful discussions as it relates to, you know, what's going on and what's needed in the community, structured or topics, it's all, all a matter of preference. Okay. <laughs> but, but this dialogue right here has been really great, especially tying everything that I'm hearing to what I'm doing. You know, um, even this whole purpose thing, when we rolled out our first um, uh, employee review, you know, we didn't have core values, right? And a lot of the questions was, and some of the questions in the employee review tied back to people identifying their purposes and stuff. And it was like, well, how do we do that? You know, um, so it just kind of prepared us for the next one and to be able to do that. So this is great. This is great. Wonderful. I'm glad to hear it. Very good. Orlando, you're on mute, friend. Oh, no. I was, I was just saying, wow, because um, to Anthony's point. But yeah, 
I, I love, I always love hearing your five points. Uh, so I can't wait till you start going over that, especially for the millennials uh, to hear that and hopefully get a sense of being the business partner first early in their career, especially for Cindy. That'll be awesome. Mm -hmm. Sure. All right. Yeah. I, I think so too. I think it's, um, it would be good to start with the five elements and then as the community continues to grow, because I, I mean, we're going to continue to share and uh, on the platform and each month, I don't know if it, you said there were going to be monthly calls or check-ins, but each time we'll have different people with different perspective and we can just go through and after that continue to expand or even as we grow, separate or branch out into different specific topics. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, uh, specialties like if you're interested in benefits or if you're interested in talent acquisition if you're interested in more um like finance for hr i'm just like thinking out loud but yeah, no, it's great i would love that i would love for orlando to host a personal branding session mm -hmm. right and invite everybody from the community to join him and let him facilitate that and you know if there's something that you guys are passionate about that you take the initiative to you know schedule something and and we can we can offer things to one another as part of this community and and there will be down the road there will be paid versions of different things, right? There'll be different subscription plans that I will be offering. There'll be different content that I'll be offering, but there will always be an element that is just community-based for the sake of the community, because I do believe in the power of community, and I believe that we have to help one another so that we can all collectively get better and, and kind of rise above where we need to be. Um, and I think the more we can support one another in, in that, uh, that growth and development, the better off all of us will be, so. I'm excited. Well, thank you all. Um, I, I love the chat that we've had and, and sharing. Anthony, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being willing to be recorded. Um, I, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I will be scheduling this monthly. Um, and between now and then, if there are specific topics or things that come up in your day to day work life that you have a challenge with, I would encourage you to post it out into the, the business of HR community because we do have, you know, we're at um, a little over 50 members right now, which is amazing. I can't believe how quickly it's growing organically, but there's a lot of talent in the group already um, of people who would be willing to chime in and share their feedback, um, whether it's with the whole group or taking it offline. Um, but I'm, I'm excited about what I'm already seeing and, and the people who are participating. So thank you all. This is very exciting for me. And you'll see yourselves on LinkedIn very soon. <laughs> thank you, Barbara. Good night, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Bye-bye.